So Charlie, what states have adopted the guidelines as licensing code? So as we were saying before, um, I work for the Pennsylvania Department of Health, and we'll see Pennsylvania up there on the map. It's one of those things that we're working really hard here, uh, Doug, to, uh, to get that uh, adopted here as well. But uh, if we review it for adult daycare, you're going to see Delaware, New York, and Vermont. So I, I applaud these states because knowing of going through the process and what it takes from a state agency and uh, you're trying to get these adoptions made, it is very difficult. Uh, for assisted living facilities, we even have more. We have Delaware, Florida, Louisiana, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Um, and it gets even better as we go to hospice facilities. There you have over 10 different states that have adopted the guidelines. Um, and then when we go to nursing homes, we have uh, over 20. So uh, I think this is wonderful. Uh, you almost have you know, half, of the, half of the states. Uh, and uh, hopefully one of these days we'll have Pennsylvania on there very soon. And uh, you know, working with Steve and, and Doug and Jane with the guidelines, I think we can do it. Um, and it's one of those where uh, it's very important to get this resource out. And it's one of the reasons why we're, we're here today is to make sure everybody uh, knows that the resource is out there and that they start using it. So even though the guidelines, the residential guidelines, are not adopted in the state of Pennsylvania for these types of facilities, how are you using them with the design community and also the owner community? Right. So we do uh, spend a lot of time in reference to uh, a lot of um, facilities will come in and they'll say, we're looking at building a new facility. We just don't know how to do it. We'll give them the guidelines as a resource. Uh, we'll also give them those, uh, those learning journeys, I think, that you were calling them uh, earlier. But we'll, uh, we'll say, you know what, maybe you should talk to Steve Lindsay at Garden Spot or here's some other uh, uh, nursing home facilities that you should talk to that have gone through the process and do the tours. So it's still a very good resource, even though we haven't adopted it. I know you can't speak for other states, but what do you think the other states are doing with regards to these types of uh, facilities and the application of the guidelines? So um, from an AHA perspective, it's uh, very difficult uh, at times when someone brings in a project where you don't have requirements or you don't have requirements that you, know, you fit what they're bringing in for the project. So while you might not have uh, those requirements, you do seek out resources. And I would hope the other states are seeking out the resources of here's a very good book. Even though our requirements uh, don't address this, we can use this as guidance to help us when we're reviewing these projects. Uh, I think that would be a great way for them to, to use the guidelines as well. Steve, what about you as from a provider perspective? Yeah, I think from a provider uh, perspective, it really is that resource you know, that we can go to just to get up to speed on, on what are the requirements, what are the things we need to be thinking about, how are we going to design a building that's going to function well in the long term. And so the guidelines provide not just the minimum standards, um, but it also gets into a whole wealth of information that helps us to understand uh, what the current thought processes are around design and, uh, and construction of, of whatever building type we're working on at that particular time. So it's a phenomenal resource uh, to use in, in just in doing the research so that you can educate yourself to know what are the issues and, and how are you going to respond to those proactively. And Jane, as a design professional, how do you use the guidelines in these states where they're not using them as regulation? So as a design company, we also do that in terms of using it as a resource. But what we've also found is that a lot of times providers, if they don't know about the Facility Guidelines Institute, they don't know that they have this great resource out there. And so we've been actually able to explain models by giving them information. And the other part that I think design professionals have really been using is that upfront planning, design, and construction section. Because when we get into that operation piece, the functional program, the EOC, all those different components that they can help guide their providers through that process. It gives them a way to do it, and that's what they're really asking. Like if we do presentations, they're asking us, how do we do that? How do we, you, you say functional program, we see what it kind of is, but how do we do one? And so, so the guidelines give them that information kind of step by step how to do it. And I think that that's probably the biggest resource we've seen. And then, uh, minimum guidelines just in general. So if we're doing assisted living or it's a firm that gets selected that doesn't have any experience in healthcare, which happens more frequently than you'd think, um, they may use those just because they need guidance because they have no idea how to go about 
where to start. Um, so it gives you minimum criteria, but it gives that appendix material, I think, is what really is very valuable for the designer. Um, when we did our presentation, Steve and I had done a live presentation at Leading Age and Environments for Aging. We had a couple of architects come up and just say, thank you for doing this, because <laughs> right. they needed the guidance. They needed the information. And I've actually seen some projects where they'll take the state requirements and the guideline requirements side by side, and then if one is more stringent than the other, they'll just meet the more stringent one, but they're designing to, to both. Uh, that way, you know, if there's anything that they might think that's missing from the state requirements, they're catching it with the FGI, but they're also meeting the, the basic state requirements for physical environment as well. And Steve, um, I've been dealing with the guidelines for almost 40 years now, and one of the things that we have a lot of difficulties in doing is getting guidelines adopted within the various states. How do you think the providers can help in getting the guidelines adopted? Yeah, I, I think there's huge opportunity here, Doug. Um, the providers are all constantly complaining about the fact that the, you know, the standards in their state may be outdated, you know, written 10, 15, 20 years ago. And so they have to work through all kinds of waivers in order to build a building that meets the standards of today's environment and, and the needs of today's marketplace. Um, this is a phenomenal opportunity for providers to kind of gather together around this issue and create some advocacy, get some momentum uh, within their uh, state legislators and, and really push this through. That this is a, a model, this is a, a set of guidelines that's continuously updated. And so there's, um, we're not going to fall back into that trap of having outdated standards uh, that often exist in many states. The key for us as providers is to A, become aware of the opportunities that it presents uh, to get educated on it, and then B, to begin to create some advocacy momentum around the adoption process and, and really become more vocal uh, with our state legislators and, and let them know the opportunities and advantages uh, that the guidelines provide for us and for their constituencies across their states. You know, Jane, the design professional is in the perfect role to assist in getting the guidelines adopted within the various states. Can you give us a little bit more information on that? Yeah, I think that it's interesting because the the design professional meets with different providers. They, it's their clients. And instead of saying, you know, using check boxes and saying, yes, yes, this is what we can do, they can actually help promote alternative care models and supporting them through utilizing the guidelines to do that. But then I also think that they can work with their clients to help encourage them to work with their colleagues to adopt them. So I think they're, they're in a role because they're going to be around more providers, just similar to the AHJ, it's going to be around more providers and, and their clients in terms of their client base to encourage change and innovation and so that gives them that creative role but also the supportive role of how they can get to be more creative which is to, to support the guidelines and have them adopted in each state. 